The uh, topic about groups as the uh, heart of interaction. So we have learned uh, in your previous lesson about socialization and enculturation that we usually uh, interact with others and learn via socialization. Now one of the most common ways of learning how to socialize is by being or joining into groups. And now let's go ahead and take a lesson on how we can uh, take groups and learn from it. So due to socialization, we actually uh, often create our own social groups. And uh, this is how we socially identify ourselves. Uh, in life, we usually join a group of friends. We also join some organizations. And these friends or organizations usually define us who we are. To start off, let's uh, check on the terms called social categories and social aggregates. When we say social categories, this is actually a collection of individual people who share one or more characteristics. Let's take, for example, you in your own section. So when we say people inside this classroom, we can categorize them as either the section, stem one, stem two, three or four, four or five, or we can categorize them as bed and students. So under social categories, any category that you can apply to these individual groups of people, they can fall under social categories. Another term is called social aggregates. So on the other hand, we still have individual people gathered together, but this time they don't have any form of interaction or the interaction is limited. So uh, social aggregates just happens to be uh, people who are in the same place and at the same time, but with minimal interaction. Example would be uh, mall goers, people in the marketplace, audience at a movie house, or fans at the game. They are there for a reason, but it doesn't really categorize them into anything. Is that clear? I hope that's clear. Now let's define social groups. We define social groups as a uh, collection of individuals who have letter A, regular contact, letter B, frequent interaction, letter C, mutual influence and a common feeling of belongingness, and number four, these are people who work together to achieve a common set of goals. So this is how we define social groups. If you don't meet often, or if you don't meet at all, you cannot be considered as a social group. If you don't have a mutual influence or mutual feeling of belongingness, you cannot be considered as a social group. And if you don't work, or if you work against each other's goals, you're not a social group. So under the under this, we actually have what we call categories of groups. There are two. We have primary groups and secondary groups. So primary groups, usually these are small groups characterized by uh, intimate or very close relationships which bind the members together. Classic examples would be family, close friends, or childhood friends. So primary groups are usually uh, small, and they also are tight-knit. And the relationship, remember this, the relationship is longer-lasting. Now moving on to the uh, second uh, category of groups, we actually have what we call secondary groups. Under secondary groups, they can either be large or small, but commonly, they're actually large. So common interests bind these members together, and the goal is more important than the relationship. Classic example would be a group of laborers, a group of workers, organizations, or a uh, project group. 
So they focus not on maintaining relationship, but rather they focus on their one and only goal. So relationships here are very short term and impersonal. Uh, we can say formal, very formal. Usually found at school, at work, and interest clubs. Now the last one, we actually have uh, the reference groups. So these are the uh, members or individuals in a group which we compare ourselves to. So reference groups can be uh, defined as any person or group of persons who significantly influence an individual's behavior. So reference groups are uh, classified into two based in terms of feeling of belongingness. We have uh, in-group and out-group. Let's start with in-groups. So in-groups is a type of a reference group wherein uh, members often use titles, external symbols, and dress to distinguish themselves from others. It is a group where an individual feels he or she belongs. And uh, usually, for in-groups, one feels loyalty and respect for these groups. Classic example of in-groups would be uh, the military, a sports team, a gang, a group of friends, or a fashion trend. Yeah. So characteristics of an in-group. Uh, in an in-group, member also... Uh, apply positive stereotypes to their uh, own member and they apply negative stereotypes to other people who are not part of the in-group. So usually people who do not conform to the standards of the in-group are considered as members of the art group. There's a term what we call uh, in-group favoritism. This, uh, this term actually refers to the uh, feeling of being superior over other groups. So in-group favoritism is having the, uh, uh, having the self-esteem by making members feel superior over other groups. Let's say you're a member of San Beda. If we uh, apply in-group favoritism, you would think that San Beda, San Beda is the best school and it's better school than other schools. So in a way, it's like ethnocentrism. All right, and we have the out groups. It's actually very uh, clear that uh, it was named out groups because it refers to people who are out of the group or people who don't belong to the group. So out groups are a, a group wherein an individual is not a part of and does not identify with. And usually negative attributes are often associated with these individuals. Now take note, we can be a member of the in-group and the out-group at the same time. Take for example, terrorists, um, ISIS. Members of the ISIS are part of the ISIS in-group, but at the same time, they are part of the government military out-group. So we, it usually happens that based on our relationship with others, we can be an in-group to them or an out-group to them. So one good thing about having reference group is that it actually affects us in two ways. We have the uh, normative effect and we have the comparison effect. When we say normative effect, uh, this happens when an individual receives positive self-evaluation. So when you're doing what the group wants you to do, you actually feel that you're doing the right thing. And that's what we call normative effect. On the other hand, we have a comparison effect. This is a result of negative self-evaluation. So let's say you're in a group and you saw that other members of your group are doing better than you. So actually compare yourselves with them. And this feeling of comparison, or this comparison actually elucidates a feeling of wanting to be better in order to meet the group standards. And that's what you call the comparison effect. 
This is actually the attempt of an individual to alter his behavior in accordance with the standards of the group. And so basically, socialization depends on the size of the group that they belong in. A large group uh, tends to promote detachment through indirect interaction. So under large groups, um, people are impersonal and very formal. So there's, the relationship is very short-lived and indirect. But these large groups also uh, break into small parts. And from these small parts comes primary groups. Let's take, for example, um, inside the classroom, we see that in your section, you can be, can, you can be uh, categorized as, let's say, uh, STEM 1 or STEM 2. Uh, within STEM 1, it's actually a very large group. So you tend just to uh, follow the uh, goals that this large group is in. But during break times, you notice that people actually uh, group themselves according to their preference. Like, for example, a group of friends. Now, from this large group, STEM 1, when they break out into smaller groups, we can see a common denominator among these small groups. And these common denominators or categories actually help them form the primary groups. And last term for the day, we have what we call the groupthink. So a groupthink is the psychological influence exerted over us by our respective groups in moral, legal, scientific, and religious matters. So groupthink is a phenomenon where people tend to confirm or conform with group decisions to avoid feeling outcast. So under groupthink, what the uh, group wants to do, usually uh, agree with it. There are certain groups that even have scientific influence over their members. Like for example, we have the anti-vaccination group or the Flat Earthers Society. They have convinced their members that the earth is flat and that vaccines are bad for us, even without any scientific evidence. And that ends our lesson for today. So as a part of your assignment, uh, I'll give you a task. I need you to uh, follow the tasks after this video. Thank you and good luck.